And we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank all of you that are here uh, present to, uh, so that we can share this conversation about our environment and uh, the things that are damaging our environment. And I think the other thing is that we want to know what can we do about to stop uh, some of the attacks that we have on our environment. I want to share with you some of our experiences we had at the Farmers Union uh, in, in, so that we were able to stop some of the use of some of these pesticides. Uh, we know that 80% uh, of the pesticides that are used are used in our farms. And it's unfortunate too because I think most people don't realize that uh, the poisons that are put on our food, and that, and that's, you know, the scientific name of pesticides is economic poisons. That's exactly what they're called, economic poisons. And people don't realize that these uh, pesticides that are, are put on our food, uh, the consumer uh, might think, oh, well, maybe somebody out in the field is making sure that uh, the crops uh, uh, are washed before they get into our supermarket. But we have to say to people, hey, they don't go through the car wash, right? The way that the lettuce is packed out there in the field, the way that the strawberries are put into the little boxes, uh, the way that the grapes are packed, that is exactly the way they go to your supermarket. There is nothing in between that is going to cleanse those crops uh, to make sure that they're safe for you to eat. And so we know, uh, because we do not have the vigilance, we don't have the protections out there, that we in the United States of America, we have the highest cancer rate in the world. The highest cancer rate in the world. And, and it's interesting too, because some of the practices that we use in the United States are actually banned in other countries. I'm gonna mention one particular gas, a called methyl bromide. Now, when you think of a gas, there's really no way to stop a gas that it goes out into the atmosphere. And we know that this particular a gas has uh, been responsible for many deaths in the United States of America. And yet, uh, you know, Europe, Europe banned this pesticide decades ago, and we continue to use it in the United States. And of course, the reason that they can continue to use uh, these pesticides and, and these gases, like the bromide and others, is because of the strong lobby that the agricultural uh, department has, and of course, many of the petroleum companies, the Farm Benefit Federation and others. And so there's just a lot of money that is being made on all of these uh, poisons that are used on our food and so that they continue to use them. I wanted to tell you about uh, what happened to us uh, several years ago, I should say back in the 80s, uh, when actually we went door to door, going to the homes of the farm workers and asking them, hey, have there been any uh, and any uh, disabilities in your household because of the use of these pesticides. What we found was horrifying because there were children that were born without arms, without legs, with pieces of their spine missing, you know, all of these with fingers missing. It, w it was horrible. And in fact, there was one family that we found that they had uh, a fetus, basically, because when the child was born, it was, you know, they didn't even have any eyes. I mean, these terrible things, and, and this was happening to the workers, and of course, the cancer rate among the farm workers themselves was extremely high. Well, all of this, you know, prompted Sessa at that point in time, uh, and this is, of course, before he passed away, that he actually did a 36-day water-only fast. He passed over 36 days of water only because he wanted to bring uh, to the attention of the of the of the world about in the public about uh, the uh, children and the farm workers that were being killed by the use of these pesticides. And you know, you know, it, uh, so uh, one of the things, of course, we did in the farm workers movement was to make sure that we could get some of these pesticides banned. One of them, of course, way back in the early days of the 60s and the 70s, we were able to get DDT banned. Now, it was great to say, okay, we got it banned in the United States of America, but then what they did is they just took the GDT to, to uh, uh, Mexico and to other countries in Central America, and they used the, the DDT over there. And we know the DDT, which is a chlorinated hydrocarbon, that it has a, a half-life of over 60 years, so it takes forever for it to ever be able to get out of our environmental system. Now, we were very more, we were more fortunate and getting some of these other organic phosphates banned, uh, as, and so like Dinoseb and Parathion. And I remember when I was negotiating contracts with the growers, uh, you know, on the fields and we're talking about banning some of these pesticides, the use of these pesticides. And when we first started talking about Parathion, they had a re-entry date of seven days. 
that the workers could go back into the fields after seven days after they sprayed parasite. And then they extended it to 14 days. And then they extended it to 30 days. And it wasn't until a whole group of farm workers were poisoned with parathion that we were finally able to get it banned entirely. And you know, the sad thing about the, the, some of these poisons is that the, they have been testing them on human beings. From Hilda Solis, who was recently the head of the Department of Labor in the United States of America, and when she was a congressperson, they were actually going to put into an experimental field using students and farm workers, and they were going to spray them with a pesticide uh, to see what the reaction to the pesticide was. Luckily, uh, so the Hilda Solis found out about this before they actually did it and was able to put a stop to it. But again, that shows kind of the disregard that there is for how these uh, poisons are going to affect actual human beings. And uh, so we know that there has to be a lot more that has to be done on, in this whole area. Uh, I remember once when we were in a field and a lot of farm workers were affected. Now this poison, uh, that particular pesticide had already been banned. Uh, but what they did is they kind of changed it and, and you know, and, and, and uh, they said, well, now it's an improved pesticide. And when we went out to the field and some of the reporters that went out there, we actually had TV crews go out there and they said, well, the workers look all right to us. And I asked one of the workers to take off his shirt. They had actually used this pesticide in citrus field. When he took off his shirt, his whole chest was full of blisters. And they had poisoned that whole entire crew with that particular pesticide. And then eventually we were able to get that one banned also. But when we think of over the years, what, what these pesticides, the harmful effect that it has, especially on children. Because children, because their, their bodies are small, you know, their reaction is uh, so much more vulnerable uh, to the effect of these pesticides. And it is very tragic, especially for the farmer for children, to think how they're affected. And, and then we say, okay, well, maybe they're using these pesticides out there in the field. The fields are not we're close to the nearest town. But we have had neighborhood and towns here in the San Joaquin Valley, California, where an entire town, like a little town called Early Mart, one of the towns in the Central Valley, not too far from Delano, where the people in that entire town were poisoned with pesticides. Because the drip, it comes into the, it, it comes into the neighborhoods also, and it comes into the town, so there's no way to stop it. And I was mentioning earlier about methyl bromide. Well, they have a gas that was similar to methyl bromide, and we went to a hearing. Now, this was a hearing by the EPA. And you know what they were talking about? Uh, how they could build a fence and have some kind of a barrier? Now. I remember sitting in that hearing and thinking, what are we doing sitting here? We should be out there picketing this hearing, you know? Because this is so ridiculous. How can you put a fence to stop a gas? There's no way that you can do that. Because the air is going to take that and it's going to drift and it's going to drift into people's homes. And even today, we have our, our discussions and arguments that are going on right now in many of our Central Valley school districts talking about what they call barrier zones, barrier zones. You know, how many uh, hundreds of feet or hundreds of yards uh, can, can you put between a school and a place where they, where they spray these pesticides? Now, the thing is this, that all the studies have shown that ultimately these pesticides don't really stop the pests anyway. They still lose about 25% of the crop uh, to pesticides. And then to take it to the next level, when you have companies like Monsanto that have you know, developed plants that have the pesticides in the plants, right? The, and this is supposed to be to, uh, to keep the, the insects away. And then the other thing that they do is that they do this mass spraying uh, to kill all, all of the so-called weeds. And uh, what happens is because they're going to protect certain crops, but then again, they saturate the ground with more pesticides. And, and some of the weeds that they kill are the weeds that actually, that that uh, like the monarch butterflies, okay? They depend on the milkweed uh, to be able to sustain themselves, but they have sprayed so many pesticides that have, so, that have killed the milkweed, and so now the monarch butter, butterflies, they don't have any food, and we see that the monarch butter, butterflies have been decimated. 
you know, been decimated and by, by, by millions of butterflies that used to travel, you know, all across the United States and go down into, into Michoacan, into Mexico. And now the numbers have really, really dropped because of the, uh, the, the pesticide that they used that killed the milkweed. Uh, so this is an, an ongoing problem that we have. And uh, now I know that this has been going on for many generations right now. And so, you know, we can celebrate and say, okay, we got rid of Dinosaur, and we got rid of DDT, and we got rid of Parathion, and some of the other uh, pesticides that we call the dirty dozen. But guess what? They just come up with brand new ones, right? And we know that the testing itself, the testing itself is, is, is not done in a way uh, that really guarantees that people are going to be safe. And it, it's kind of uh, sad when you think that we in the United States that we use more pesticides than anybody else in the world. Now, I think that the ultimate solution for pesticides ultimately is going to be that we have to put the application of pesticides, with, again, these economic poison, take it out of the EPA, take it completely out of the EPA, uh, take it out of the Department of Agriculture, and put it under the Health and Human Services. You know, it's, it's a, this is a health issue, and uh, this should be put under Health and Human Services, taken out of the hands of agriculture and the EPA. Uh, we had a situation uh, a few years ago, maybe about five or six years ago, where there was a plant that manufactured Dynasep, another cancer-causing uh, pesticide. And we were able to ban Dynasep and completely make them stop using it. But the factory that they had contaminated the dirt. And this is a little town called Arvin, California. Many of you have, I think, seen the movie The Grapes of Wrath, right? If you haven't seen it again. Uh, but this is a, a little town right there where The Grapes of Wrath was filmed. And the, 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 uh, the pesticide, the dinosaur, had seeped into the dirt where they had actually manufactured. And it had contaminated the groundwater. And it had gone into one, two, three layers of groundwater. So it was now about going to go into the last layer of the groundwater where the whole water supply of that town of Arbor, California would be contaminated with this dinosaur leftover, this pesticide. Well, what was the EPA going to do? They said, oh, we'll come in and we'll put in some kind of a clay uh, floor in there uh, so that it won't go, get down to the, to the water. But you know what? The workers in that area, they got together. There's a great organization called, uh, the, uh, it's called CRP, the Center for uh, Race and Poverty Environment. And everybody got together in the town and we protested. EPA came out there and they were met with hundreds of people that were just yelling at them and saying, we want you to do something about this. So we were finally able, because of the fact that the community got together, that they had to take out all of the dirt that was contaminated. Completely took it completely out to make sure that that groundwater would not be contaminated uh, in that farm worker uh, community. So, you know, this was, of course, very effective, uh, and we were able to make that happen. But, and actually, when I was lobbying in Sacramento, this is way many years ago, back in the 70s, I was actually able to get a bill out of the state assembly that said just that take the pesticides and put them under the Department of Health. And it got it out of the assembly, but they killed it in the Senate. And that was, what, 40 years ago. And here we are talking exactly about the same issues. Uh, and we know that uh, if, if when we talk about the pesticides contaminating our water, uh, then that, that you know brings us in, into the whole other issue that we have right now about how can we keep our water uh, pure and clean uh, so that people will uh, not be worried about that here. In the Central Valley of California, of course, we're having a huge drought. Uh, it's when we're not off for the last four years. So we now have in some communities that don't have any water at all, that they are now having the water trucked in, and they're going to have, they're going to, have to provide a water, just like they do in Mexico and some of the places over there. They have to truck the water in, and people have to bring their water bottles, and they have to fill them up because they literally, the water is gone. And it's kind of sad when we think that in California, I guess that one of the good things that's come out of this drought, that all of a sudden people are saying, hey, maybe we need to think about some conservation measures, okay? Because 
it's interesting that I remember, I don't know if I'm saying people that might be in the audience that are a little bit older, uh, that some of you might remember when you were young that uh, our parents had a rain barrel uh, when they used to catch the rainwater, then people used that rainwater. I remember we used to use it to wash our hair and then use some of that rainwater to uh, wash clothes, etc. But we don't have that anymore. And in California, because of the drought, for the very first time, people are starting to think about, hey, why don't we think about water conservation? Another interesting fact that has happened in California is that you have some of our agricultural interests that own the water. How about that? They actually own the water. And some of them, even though they're saying, okay, uh, you know, we need more water, but then they turn around and they sell the water uh, to some of the cities. So some of these same growers that are saying we need more water, they have water and they turn around and they sell it uh, to some of the cities. So when we think about water as a, as a utility that we cannot have life without water, and yet that we kind of take it for granted and we don't think of preservation, and we don't think about how it's, good, how it's being distributed, we don't think about how some people can own water when this is a natural resource. How can that be that some people can own water and that other people can turn around and sell it at the same time that we don't have enough of the water? So I think that uh, what you were doing in Colorado and, and, and Conejos uh, is really, I think, an example for the rest of the country. So maybe people can have to make an applause, all right? Let's do a big applause there. I see people pointing over there. <laughs> That it's obvious that you will be able to, uh, to teach the rest of us, uh, you know, what we can do uh, to conserve water. I, I remember going to New York once and they had this play called, I don't know if you heard about this play called You're in Town. This is kind of a satirical uh, play that they made about, about called You're in Town, uh, which uh, really, uh, they were, they, people had to ration uh, to be able to get water. And, I remember seeing also a picture of our earth, you know, our whole entire earth. We just look at the marble and the blue marble, and they were showing the amount of water that we actually have to drink uh, in the whole planet. And it's scary when you see how small the amount of water, fresh water, that we actually have on earth. So, of course, here in California, they're talking about uh, desalinating a water so that we can have more water. Like right now, we've had this drought, and now we're having this huge rainy season, and that's just come because of El Nino. But then you see all of the water that's running off. It's just running off, and there's no method or no control about how, how we, what are we gonna do to try to conserve the water that we have. So this is a very, very scary issue for all of us uh, to think about. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, visit uh, this school in Tucson, Arizona, and I don't know if people know about this place here, but here, this was a, a little grammar school in Tucson, Arizona, and they had cisterns. You know, Arizona is pretty, a pretty dry place, as we know, you know. And they had these water cisterns, huge cisterns on the school. And they captured all of the rainwater, and then with that water that they had, they, they were able to catch all of the rainwater, and uh, they were able to use that rainwater, not only for the use of the school there, but guess what, they also had gardens. And they had a garden for each one of the classes. And this was a grammar school. And it was so awesome uh, to see the children. Every, every classroom in that school, every separate classroom had their own little plot of garden. You know, And one of the classrooms was responsible to take care of the worms, right? <laughs> and take, to take, make sure that they uh, were able to, uh, to uh, take care of the earth so that they could fertilize the gardens. And then they had another one that had cucumbers, and one had tomatoes, and one had peppers, and one had kale. And each one of the little classrooms had their own garden that they tended. But the, and oh, by the way, they also had solar panels, all right, at that school is an example uh, for the rest of the Southwest on how not only can we conserve water, but then how we can also grow our, our own food. And by the way, all of the food that they were growing was organic. There were no pesticides on that food at all. And uh, it, what a great example, if we could just duplicate this in many of our schools throughout the country and start educating everyone how we can grow food without pesticides, you know, grow organic food and conserve water. All of these lessons all at the same time in terms of, again, preserving Mother Earth, 
uh, to make sure that we do have a planet that, that is a, a safe environment for our children. Uh, I noticed that um, one of the issues that, that you have been talking about here is about the Bureau of Land Management and about uh, people using uh, what we call federal land for their own use. And that's a really, uh, I think, an interesting concept because uh, we know that there have been recently uh, some uh, spectacular wars about people that want to use uh, the uh, federal land for uh, grazing cattle, et cetera, and somehow they think that we should be able to do that. And yet we know that President Obama has really uh, been in the forefront of preserving as much of our federal land as we can and using it for international funds uh, so we can preserve it for future generations. And uh, and I think that that's, a, that's a definitely uh, an issue uh, that all of us have to really step up to and, and support that we can have our federal lands preserved and that they should not be used uh, for commercial enterprise or, or commercial purposes. Uh, you know, some of them, some people want to use that commercial land to go for oil, for instance. Uh, and, uh, as I said before, some of them want to use it for grazing, but that means that that land is going to go to corporation and it really belongs to the people and it, 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 you know, it shouldn't be used that way, uh, you know, just uh, used uh, for commercial purposes and taken away from us, basically, the taxpayers who want to conserve conserve those lands. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I think that's a, a great fight. I'm glad to see that uh, many people are, are really involved in, in that in that fight. Uh, when we talk about these issues, I was just recently involved in the GMO labeling fight. Uh, it, this is kind of interesting because in Washington, D.C., and we were just able to kill this bill just recently, but what Monsanto did uh, with some of their friends in the Congress, they introduced a bill that would prohibit any state or county from making uh, GMO legally mandatory. It's just the opposite of states' rights, right? I mean, because usually the conservatives say that, okay, States have the right to pass what any laws that they, that they want. Well, the bill that they had said no, because there have been several states, Vermont and uh, some of the New England states, that have actually passed laws that said, yes, our foods that have been genetically modified should have a label on them. Now, we had that initiative here in California as a proposition, and all of the agricultural interests came up and, oh, no, it's going to cost too much money uh, to put labels on the food. Hey. When we go into the grocery store and we buy an avocado, it's got a little sticker on it, right? If you buy an apple, it's got a sticker on it. If you buy a banana, it's got a sticker on it. So they're already putting stickers on the food. Again, when American uh, uh, growers, our agricultural growers here, when they say it's sending food to Europe or they send food to Brazil and some of these other countries, they've got to put the labels on them if it's been genetically modified. Isn't that interesting? The food that they grow here, if it's genetically modified, it's got to have a label on it if it goes to another country that already has these laws in place that says that the food has got to be labeled if it's genetically modified. And here in the United States, they're finding to say it's too expensive, even though they put a sticker on, on, on all of these other foods that, that we purchase. So and it shows how idiotic it is that, that our agricultural corporations here they know they have to put the labels when they ship the food to other places, but they won't do it here in the United States. Now, I don't know how they get away with that. Well, I guess one of the ways that they get away with it is because elections matter, right? Elections matter. And the people that are elected to Congress are the ones that are uh, make up these laws or they go along uh, and introduce this bill that, uh, that uh, Monsanto had uh, to uh, prevent the GMO labeling got out of the House of Representatives, got out of the Senate Agricultural Committee, and was ready to be voted on the, on the floor. And luckily, we were able to kill it at the last minute, okay? It was just by, by a threat that we were able to stop it. Uh, so, you know, this again is another big thing we have to think about. When we talk about genetically modified foods, and I know there's been entire books that, that have been written on the subject, you know, because we do have such a long lifespan as human beings, that it's really hard to tell exactly what the effect is going to be on our bodies in, in the long run. And right now, unfortunately, we know that a lot of our, our, our food, like, the, like soybeans, so many of the soybeans have been genetically modified already that it's, again, it's, I think, probably even hard to find 
any kind of so soybeans that have not been uh, genetically modified. And we know that other countries like uh, India and places like that, where many of the farmers, uh, you know, when uh, they, these are genetically modified uh, seeds that they have, they actually are able to jump and go into other uh, places, even though they're trying to stop from growing uh, genetically modified crops, they, uh, they actually uh, are able to jump into the other areas and uh, they end up with these genetically modified uh, plants even though they have no, no, no uh, desire to go to this kind of food. So you know, I used to say all the time way back in the 70s, you know how the oil companies managed to get control of all of the oil and the energy that we have, and so we are de so dependent on them to get the energy that we have. And when we think of country, uh, companies like Monsanto that can kind of control the food supply, and they went in there and they bought all of these seeds. I remember the United Farm Workers at one time, we had contracts with many of these small seed companies. Well, you know what? They don't exist anymore. They don't exist anymore because the big corporations, again, like Monsanto and the other ones, they have bought up all the seed supply. And so farms are totally depend on, on those uh, companies to get their seeds. And then the other thing, too, is that many of the seeds that they buy, they, they, have, they only use them for that one crop. And then they have to buy new seeds, right? For before you could actually get the seed and you could regenerate the seed um, from, the, from the crops that you grew. But now that is also. So I, I, it seems to me, and maybe this is kind of a paranoid thought, that again, the way that we have the oil companies that control the oil supply, we have these corporations that are going to control our food supply. And we're going to be completely dependent on them. And that, again, is a very, very scary thought. The other thing, too, is when I control the seed supply, that means that before when you had uh, some certain crops, you had many varieties of a certain crop, and now you don't, you know? Because so many of those, uh, those seeds, because they're not, they're not used anymore, and so I think that's like kind of a whole new movement because there are some organizations that are just going out there and trying to find some of the seeds that have not been taken off the market and that they don't exist anymore. So, you know, I, I guess it sounds, sounds like really dire news, right? <laughs> and it seems like, okay, and, and it may, may be kind of de depressing, uh, but uh, again, we have to go back and say that we've got to start getting people uh, that elected to office that are actually going to protect us, that are going to protect our food, that are going to protect our, our, uh, our energy supplies and, and definitely, uh, you know, be able to uh, 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 protect our environment. And the thing is that when we talk about, about pesticides, there are alternatives. I remember uh, going to Cuba, and in Cuba, they have actually developed uh, a, uh, it, it, it's a, some kind of an application that they can put on the crops that is not uh, oil-based, and it's not a pesticide. It's a plant-based, and they get it from a tree uh, that goes in India. And it doesn't have any harmful effects on human beings. But because Cuba has, has had this economic boycott on it, where they cannot, uh, you know, they cannot uh, market uh, some of the products that they develop, they have not been able to market this particular product. So one of the things we can do, of course, is to uh, work with the Congress and petition the Congress and put pressure on them to end the economic boycott on Cuba, and then maybe that they can start marketing uh, this particular formula that they have been able to uh, develop. Uh, to be able to put this application on our crops uh, that is plant-based and that will actually uh, be able to keep uh, the pests away uh, from destroying our food. And we know that there's uh, other ways that they uh, can, have actually been able to, um, uh, to stop uh, insects from killing the food, and that is uh, by uh, being able to rotate the crops, uh, by uh, being able to also, um, once, that the, once that a crop is finished, of actually plowing under that particular harvested crop uh, to make uh, the uh, the ground stronger, I mean, more fertile, and then actually the, the, the crops that they grow then will be stronger and, and be more uh, pest resistant. Uh, so I think that we have to try to, uh, you know, uh, actually encourage uh, this, these other types of, uh, of practices that we call integrated pest management. Governor Jerry Brown, when he was elected the first time around in 1974, he actually 
I had uh, people going out and talking to all of the farmers in California about trying to see if they could do some of these different types of uh, uh, integrated carcinogen practices uh, to stop the growing use of pesticides. Uh, because, uh, and I wish that I could say that after all of these years that we have actually been able to decrease the use of pesticides, but unfortunately uh, it hasn't. But the use of pesticides uh, continues uh, to grow and and, uh, and and the reason, of course, is because it, there's a lot of money in it, right? It's uh, it's sad. I remember once uh, one of the small farmers that we had a contract with, and he was a really good person. Uh, he actually, you know, he used to bring the workers over to his or to his homes, okay, to his home. He wasn't like a big corporate farmer like we have in California. By the way, a small farmer in California usually has about a thousand workers, right? We have these big corporations like the Dole Company that has like 40,000 workers throughout the state of California. So when you talk about a small farmer here, it's maybe somebody who has a couple of hundred workers. And this particular gentleman did. And the sad thing about it is he died. He died at a very young age. Because he was a small farmer and he would actually go into the vineyards and into the into, into his citrus crop and he would spray. He himself would go out there and spray his crops. And he died at a very young age. He was in his 50s when he passed away. But he died, he died of cancer. Where did he get the cancer? He died, he got that cancer from the pesticides that he sprayed. Then there was another farmer and I actually went to his home. And he had been a pesticide salesman. He was the son of a grower, his father died, he took over the farm. And but his career had been actually as a pesticide salesman. And when you, if you ever uh, get a chance, if you look at some of these uh, magazines that the, that the farmers, like the Farm Bureau puts out, and when you look at the advertisements that they have for pesticides, it's like selling candy. They talk about, you know, this pesticide and, and how, how nice it is. And, and, and it's like a marketing strategy. And I remember when I sat down to this, son of this farmer who took over dad's farm, and we were talking about these pesticides. He had no clue. He didn't even know the scientific names of pesticides. He didn't know the difference between the chlorinated hydrocarbons like the DDT or the organic phosphate. No, he didn't know. Then he invited me to come to his house, and his baby was in a crib, and that baby, that baby, had issues. And I thought to myself, how sad, how ironic that this farmer who was selling pesticides took over his dad's farm and now his own child had been affected by these pesticides. You know, and again, it comes from ignorance, right? It comes from ignorance. So I think that this seminar that you're having today, this conversation that we're having today, I think is great because this is what it is. People need to know. People need to know, because if we don't have the knowledge, then we really can't act on it, right? But then again, once we have the knowledge, then we can start acting on it. And I know that there in Colorado, uh, you have some very progressive, and maybe some not so progressive, but you have some very progressive uh, legislators that you have. I have met with your senator, uh, Senator Bennett, you know? And in fact, he's one of the people that we met with on this GMO, GMO labeling uh, to get his help on this. And I also know that Senator Bennett is one of the people that's being targeted, right? That they're trying to target him uh, to try to get him out of the Senate. So again, when we come back and we talk about what can we do to change this, we've got to get some champions. We've got to get some people there in the Congress that will really stand up and will fight uh, for the consumers and fight for the growers, fight for the farm workers, fight for our environment and stand up to these practices and not let these uh, giant lobbyists like Monsanto, like the Farm Bureau Federation, like the Western growers, and some of these big, uh, very wealthy lobbyists come in there and intimidate our legislators so that they will be afraid uh, to take on some of these issues. And so I know that all of you are going to be active, right, in the elections. I see people sparking up there and saying that they go yet. <laughs> And this is one of the things, of course, that we really advocate for. I like to say to people that, I mean, those of you that are in the room and have asked the question, uh, how many of you voted, 
Can I ask the question? How many of you voted? Let me see your hands. There they go. Okay. Now I'm going to ask another question. Up, up there and knocked on doors, getting other people out to vote. Can I see those hands? All right, our hand number Can I just say that those of you that held your hands up, I'm sure that you were able to get anywhere from maybe 40 to maybe 60 people out to vote, you know, by just going out there, knocking on doors, doing the phone banking. So I would just I'd say to the rest of you, please, in this next election, could you please all go out there and knock on doors, or do the phone banking if you can't walk. And all you still have the absentee ballots right in Colorado, right? Everybody votes absentee ballot. So I guess, you know, just getting out there to make people turn in those absentee ballots, uh, do that canvassing, do that phone banking, uh, to make sure that we get the people elected. And the other thing that I would like to also say, if you could uh, just email people and say to them that we want you to do something about these environmental threats that we have right now. You know, do something about these environmental threats uh, to make sure that uh, the, the, these fills that Monsanto and the other ag industry people are putting in there, the oil industry, that they don't pass. That they know that you, they got your support uh, because uh, if they don't hear from you, then they think that they don't have the support of the community uh, to be able to stop uh, these measures uh, that are going out there right now.